Cleanse my guilt and pride. Blood of Christ the Unleavened Bread Ministries presents From your hands your feet Unleavened Bread side. Bible Studies with Jesus David Eels. What can quench my thirsting soul? Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. Greetings, saints. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. We've been studying um, prophecies, dreams, and visions, and hopefully we'll get around one day to talk about interpretation, but right now we're kind of looking at some of the, um, the uh, boundaries that the Lord has set for understanding prophecies, dreams, and visions, or ways that God speaks to us. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, to give us understanding today, Lord. We, uh, we trust in you to open our understanding, Lord. Um, we know that your, your thoughts, your ways are so much further and higher above our ways, Lord, that we need to trust in you at every step, Lord. So we're asking, Lord, to give us wisdom concerning uh, the ways that you speak to us, Lord. And, um, and in the scriptures, of course, you've laid down uh, wisdom to know what we can do, what we can't do. And um, so we thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, for giving us wisdom today. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, our question has been of late, you know, can God change a spoken word in prophecy, dream, vision, whatever? And we're seeing from the scriptures that he can and he does and he has. And uh, matter of fact, I think one of them that we looked at was Amos's prophecy, Amos chapter 7. And we noticed that uh, God had threatened Israel twice, once with locusts. And uh, Amos interceded and, and said, Lord, how shall Jacob stand? For he is small. And uh the Lord uh, repented and decided not to judge, and but then he gave a second threat concerning fire. And um, once again, Amos interceded with the same words, and, and the Lord um, um, delayed again, basically. We discovered when we were studying Joel the other day that, um, that actually the locusts and the fire that are mentioned in Joel were speaking about the um, Assyrian army that was um, attacking Israel, but of course it was also a type and a shadow of an end time attack on God's people. And so, so this was far more serious than people thought, you know, it wasn't just a forest fire or locusts invading or whatever, you know, but, but God was using these as types, you know. I want to add something here. God can speak to us in circumstances. Since since he works all things after the counsel of his own will, and a man can receive nothing except it come from heaven, we can look at our circumstances and see God speaking, basically. Now, we know that God changes our circumstances all the time. We, what we see, especially if it has anything to do with the curse, we pray about it, and God answers, doesn't he? You know, especially if we're in right standing with him, and if we're walking by faith, and if we believe these things. So we know that God's uh, speech to us at least changes in that way. And we see, like in Amos 7, that it also changes in other ways that he speaks. Uh, as they say, prayer changes things. I like to say prayer fulfills things. It fulfills the things that God has promised to us. Uh, and from our limited perspective, uh, prayer does change things, you know, but from God's perspective, it just fulfills things. I like to learn to see things from God's perspective, you know, because um, everything's according to plan. You know, I mean, uh, since the foundation of the world, history is just repeated and repeated and repeated, letting you know that there's really only one mind in control and that uh, when we pray, it actually all it does is fulfill God's will. 
It's a method by which God brings to pass his will in the earth. He uses, he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure to pray for things that need to be prayed for. And of course, he, he got a prayer out of Amos in this particular chapter that we're talking about, Amos 7. He got the prayer that he needed out of Amos to bring it to pass. I think God has decided since by man the curse overcame the earth, by man um, the curse was going to be overcome. And of course, that's why he sent Jesus, you know, as a man and as the Son of God. And once again, he is a, is a witness to us to do the same thing. Well, so God can change, he can delay, he can delete um, a prophecy, a dream, a vision uh, through simple, in this case, just asking for mercy, okay? Uh, but also, sometimes um, we see people reasoning with God, you know, not just asking for mercy, but uh, reasoning with God that, Lord, I served you. Now, why is this happening? Do we have such an instance as that? Yeah, we do. Right? Matter of fact, in uh, Second, Second Chronicles, we have a, uh, an example of that. And um, in, in Hezekiah, Hezekiah's life, Second Kings, excuse me, Second Kings 20. And uh, this is very interesting because um, I guess you could call it a cry for mercy, but it was more so... Lord, I've served you, you know. Um, uh, won't you save me out of this, you know? And uh, this is this one is uh, particularly familiar to me because God used it on me one time. It says, In those days was Hezekiah uh, sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, uh, came to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Well, some of you already know where I'm going, but uh, I want to share with you years ago, um, I think it was about 19 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, about 19 years ago, that um, I had begun to, to, um, to pass a lot of blood. And I had sought the Lord about it, and I felt like the Lord said to me, cancer. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I don't accept things like that when they come to my mind. I just, I just, you know, that's not what God promised to me. So I accept what the Scripture says, and I stand on the Scriptures. And I never did really get worried about it at all. But one day, the Lord put it in my heart to go to a Christian bookstore Across town, it wasn't one that I normally went to because it was twice as far away as the one that was closer, and the one that was closer had a lot more books. So I went to this one because I felt to go to this one. And um, when I walked in the door, there were a couple of ladies that worked there. Um, one of them was the owner, and um, I noticed when I walked in the door, they had all eyes on me, like like they had something to say to me, you know. So as I crossed the room to, to speak to them, um, they said to me, said, David, we've been praying for different ministers that we know. And, and uh, when we were praying for you, the Lord spoke to us and said that you were having a battle with the spirit of cancer. And I said to him, I said, well, thank you for that confirmation. I think I've already heard that from the Lord and I appreciate it very much. And they said, but, but you're going to overcome the spirit i said well thank you very much god bless you and so i when i got through there i went home and on my way home i thought to myself you know when i get home i'm gonna ask the lord to speak to me concerning this out of the word you know like he does so many times so when i got home i just flipped my bible open blindly and stuck my finger down on this verse right here matter of fact it was right in the middle of this phrase which said thou shalt die and not live <laughs> so I, I thought, hmm, you know, I really wasn't worried. I still wasn't worried. I didn't feel threatened at all. I, I'd been walking in the Lord for many years for healing, and he'd never failed me. And I was very gr well grounded in the word. And um, so I thought on this, and I said, well, Lord, 
that's not according to your promise to me. That's not according to what you've taught me. You've taught me to stand only upon the word of God and the promises of the covenant. And of course, we know that by whose stripes you were healed. And uh, and also Mark 11 and 24, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them and you shall have them. And I said, so I quoted a few verses to the Lord. And of course, he knows them very well, you know. <laughs> so I didn't have to tell him anything. But I said, Lord, I don't accept this. I says, and I don't think you want me to accept this. And um, actually, it came to me a little later that the Lord was trying me like he tried um, uh, Abraham when he told him to go and sacrifice his son. He really didn't care about sacrificing humans, but uh, Abraham was being obedient, you know, and uh, he went through the trial. And of course, as you know, the Lord had a lamb in the thicket, a, a ram in the thicket to be sacrificed, which I rep I reckon represents Jesus Christ, you know, who was sacrificed for us so that we wouldn't have to die. But anyway, so I said, well, Lord, I don't think you want me to accept this. This is not anything uh, you know, that your promises have, been, have taught me. So I just reject this in the name of Jesus. And I ask you, Lord, to, to give me another um, verse that's more in line with um, with what you've taught me so i flipped my bible open and i stuck my finger down on psalm 118 and verse 17 right in the middle of this phrase it said i shall not die but live <laughs> yeah that's an awesome sovereign god you know the two verses are the exact opposite the only places in the bible that this is, you know, so I stuck my finger down right in the middle. I said, whoa, I says, OK, I'll take that one, Lord. So, uh, you know, and the Lord knew he was trying me and he wanted to see if I was going to depart from the word. For anything, even if I thought God was speaking to me, he wanted to see if I was going to depart from the word. And uh, of course, I didn't. And uh I, I got healed because the symptoms just le left more and more and more, you know, and I was healed. And anyway, to read on where Hezekiah was, Hezekiah also reasoned with the Lord here. And, um, you know, it's, it, it is a little astounding to be reasoning with the Lord because, first of all, the Lord really doesn't reason. Reason is, um, is a process of assimilating knowledge and the lord doesn't assimilate knowledge he has all knowledge he doesn't have to think things out he already knows you know so but he he's very weak to the weak and he comes down on our level and he lets us reason with him okay and hezekiah was doing this kind of like what i was doing and uh, i'll read on it says in second kings 20 and verse 2 then he, that is Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. Well, you know, we're not accounted righteous by our works. We're accounted righteous by faith. But people who walk by faith generally have a clear conscience and uh, they're able to go to the Lord with boldness, you know, as the scripture teaches. And um, Hezekiah had a clear conscience. The Bible does say the Lord does witness of him that he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, he was one of the faithful kings of God's people. So he reasoned with the Lord and, and I felt the same way. You know, I I wasn't afraid from the very beginning because I was walking with the Lord to the very best of my ability and was seeking him with all of my heart. And um, I never have really uh, lost my first love or fell away from the Lord. I've always sought him, you know, uh, from the beginning because of his grace. I've always sought more and more of him. And that's he's the most important thing to me. And I don't have any other hobbies but the Lord. So. I felt the same way as, as Hezekiah. You know, Lord, I've served you, and uh, so therefore I should be able to, to believe your 
your promises and stand upon them, you know. You know, the Bible says, you know, in Ezekiel 18, that uh, we really don't have to, to worry that as long as we're turning away from sin, the Lord says there, and um, I'll just say, read verse... Um, Verse 21, I guess. But if the wicked turn from all of his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. That's a good promise right there, right? Uh, none of the transgressions that he hath committed shall be remembered against him. So his past is forgotten, right? Uh, in his righteousness that he hath done, shall he live so i mean that's where hezekiah was that's where i was i didn't reason with the method that that hezekiah did here i reasoned with the method that okay lord this is what you've promised me this is what you've taught me and this is not in agreement with that so therefore i don't accept it um and the interesting thing was that um you know, God, everybody doesn't get, have boldness to answer God nor to reason with God. And I was just thinking about uh, Proverbs chapter 1, and it says, Because I have called, the Lord speaking, and you have refused, verse 24, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you have set it not all of my counsel and would uh, none of my reproof, I also will laugh in the day of your calamity, and I will mock when your fear cometh. And when your fear cometh as a storm, and your calamity cometh on as a whirlwind, and when distress and anguish come upon you, then will they call upon me, but I will not answer. And they will seek me diligently, but they shall not find me. Uh, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord." So there are people in Hezekiah's position that they would just have to put up with whatever God said and did because they wouldn't have boldness in faith to really uh, be able to claim the promises nor to reason with God in this way that Hezekiah did. So anyway, um, and verse 4 in 2 Kings 20 says, And it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out into the middle part of the city, in other words, he just gave him this prophecy, turned and, and left, and before he got to the middle of the city, and it ain't a big city, um, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the prince of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. And I have seen thy tears, and behold, I will heal thee, and on the third day thou shalt go up to the house of the Lord. Well, that was also something that was in my mind. As a matter of fact, this text really spoke to me at the time, because I've had a promise of going up to the house of the Lord on the third day, too. The third day meaning the third thousand years from the last Adam, uh, Jesus Christ. So this really spoke to me at the time, you know that, uh, hey, if I died now, Lord, the promises that you made me for my future wouldn't come to pass, you know. And so, you know, those are things that, that God brings to your remembrance too, you know. That, no, no, it's not your time to go. You, I've, I told you this, and I told you that, and I told you this, you know. And so, okay, Lord, I'm going to hang around and watch what you're going to do here, you know. So it was a very simple thing, actually, I, I prayed a simple prayer of faith like I always do. I, I happened to make a trip to Louisiana during that time, and I had a brother over there that was faithful, and I had him pray over me, and that was it. I, did, I just walked it out by faith, and, and God healed me, and I haven't had any trouble with that since. But it just so happens that um, um, about... Fifteen years later, <laughs> I had uh, another trial. And uh, what happened was I started having heart problems. And my heart was um, giving me pain. And I was feeling weak. 
and um, the devil was threatening me. And of course, when the devil threatens me, I um, I, I uh, call his bluff basically. And I was doing that at the time. I was I was walking and started jogging, and of course, the devil was telling me that I was going to fall out on the side of the road and I'd never make it home with my heart. You know, I didn't go to doctors, so I really didn't didn't um, couldn't you know tell you exactly what the problem was but i felt it was in my heart the problem was in my heart and um and at the time i had people that had dreams uh there were two dreams given in that time that i was going to die with a heart attack <laughs> and both of these these dreams came not from people that didn't have um you know dependable dreams they did have dependable dreams but they still said I was going to die with a heart attack. And so, again, at that time, I hadn't even thought about it being 15 years later. So I, I went and asked my wife, I says, how long has it been since I had that problem with cancer? She figured, she says, it's been 15 years. I says, oh, you know, and it suddenly came into my mind about Hezekiah uh, having his life prolonged for 15 years. And so that's verse 6 here. It says, And I will add unto thy days 15 years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the king, hand of the king of Assyria. Um, so I thought, Wow, Lord, are you saying that you only added 15 years to my life, and now that's over, and now I'm going to die? And I felt, like the Lord was saying in my spirit, yes. So I stopped and I thought on this. I said, now what's different about now than 15 years ago? I still have the same promises. I turned back to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't accept this either. And I don't think you want me to accept this either. And I don't see any reason to accept this either. And I don't accept so-and-so's dreams about me and so on and so forth. And I rebuked that in the name of Jesus, and eventually the same thing happened. The symptoms all went away. Um, you think, how could somebody who was a good person, who had a, a good uh, track record with dreams, have a dream like that? Well, because God sent that dream, just like God said, thou shalt die and not live. You mean God will try us? Yes, He will. He will try us. And He will, and He wants to know, are we going to depart from the Word? Because if you're going to depart from the Word, you're not going to have the benefit of it. Now, God doesn't tempt us. We're tempted by our own lusts, the Bible says. But God tries us. He, he uh, brings us into the trial. You know, Jesus was led of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He was led there by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be tried because God wants us to be stable in His Word. He, don't, he doesn't want us to depart from His Word for anything. You know, we need to believe the promises, not our sight, not well-meaning Christians, not prophets, not dreamers. We have Everything has to be founded upon God's Word. We don't ever depart from God's Word. And when we learn this lesson... Uh, we'll know that the most important thing to us is the foundation of God's Word. We don't ever, ever want to depart from God's Word. Well, why, why is it that God told Hezekiah this? Hezekiah asked the Lord. He sought the Lord. He asked the Lord. And God just immediately said, okay, even before Isaiah got out to the middle of the city. What's the deal here? You know, is God so easily changed? Does he change his mind? Actually, God really doesn't change his mind. He sees the end from the beginning. He doesn't have to change his mind. The changing, it only appears that he changes his mind because uh, for our sake, you see. And, and so what was God doing with Hezekiah? Well, he was getting him to pray a prayer that otherwise he would have never prayed. You know, I believe that the Bible, well, the Bible does say in um, James chapter 4 and verse 2 that you have not because you ask not. You know, quite often God has to do something to get us to pray 
in a certain way because he uses our prayers to fulfill our destiny and his will. And so you think back with Amos, I mean, the situation was God made a simple statement. And about the time he got this statement out of his mouth, um, Amos, you know, um, uh, interceded with Jacob is small. How shall he stand? And immediately God said, okay, you know, here's somebody who interceded for God's people uh, because they were not mature enough to be able to stand through this tribulation. And God said, okay, is he so easily convinced? Or is it like he said here, I have heard thy prayer. You know, he heard Hezekiah's prayer. He heard my prayer. Uh, things changed because he wanted me to pray that. And um, he wanted me to fulfill a type and a shadow which Hezekiah was fulfilling here too because he showed me a prophetic revelation about adding 15 years uh, that has to do with um, um, 2015. But I'm not going to get into that part. I just want to point out the part about the dreams, the vision, the prophecy, the command of the Lord. All of that was changed by a simple prayer to the Lord. And, uh, you know, I believe God wants us to pray without ceasing and we can pray kind of like preventive maintenance. When I used to work at, um, at Exxon uh, many years ago, I was a machinist before I was a supervisor and a specialist. And, uh, and when I was a machinist, I, I loved to keep the equipment running because once it breaks, it's very expensive. It's a lot more work to pull it out take it in the shop, tear it down, fix it, put it back together, bring it back, put it back in, have process, put it back in line, whatever this pump, driver, turbine, whatever it was, piece of equipment was, then it was to keep that thing running to begin with. We called it preventive maintenance. And uh, the man hours for preventive maintenance were minuscule compared to breakdown man hours. And so, actually, I convinced them in my particular area to let me do preventive maintenance. You see, they had got the process people, which were shifts of people that would come on, and, and um, they had made them responsible for preventive maintenance. But, hey, you couldn't tie it down to anybody there, and we were the ones that were having to fix it. So, uh, I convinced my supervisor to when I was a machinist, to let me do nothing but preventive maintenance. I said, I can save you a lot of money if you'll let me make sure this equipment keeps on going. And I knew how to keep it going. I knew what it needed. And so he agreed with that. And you know, our breakdowns dropped considerably, and they gave me an award for, this was a, our particular area was a particularly high maintenance area because we had a lot of the kind of equipment that would break down and a lot of the um, the stuff that we pumped was light ends which is very hard to seal and so on and so forth so so I would look at every piece of equipment in a certain area and then I'd move on to the next one and I did this for a while and suddenly we weren't having the breakdowns we were having you see and they gave me an award for for doing that well you know, prayer, I think, has to be the same way, is if we will pray without ceasing, we won't have to go through some things because God will use our prayers to fulfill exactly what he wants. He doesn't have to goad us into praying something that we wouldn't have ordinarily prayed otherwise, you see. So I think that the Lord taught me something here in this, you know, uh, which is relatively important that we need to pray. It's important to pray. And it's important not to depart from the Word of God for any dream, vision, or whatever. Uh, uh, even a word from God Himself, because He can try you. He did Abraham that way. He gave him a word, told him to go and sacrifice his son. Do you think he was interested in doing that? No. He was interested in saving his son. And his own son is the one that he sent to be a sacrifice for our life. And so, that was, of course, the ram that was caught in the thicket, you know, that um, Abraham ended up sacrificing, right? Well, well, this is kind of interesting, I think. And this one, this one is really stuck to me, you know, that the Lord, um, 
saved me by by showing me this verse. But anyway, we've got other examples, and I'm going to look at one over in um, Numbers chapter 11. You remember Numbers chapter 11? It's the story of, uh, excuse me, Numbers um, chapter 16. It's the story of um, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rebellion in the wilderness. Uh, they were usurping the authority of uh, Moses and Aaron. And um, basically, they had gotten the whole congregation to follow them. You know, Korah was a Levite, but Dathan and Abiram weren't Levites. They were usurping the position of a Levite, which is a priest, right? And Korah seemed, even though Korah was a Levite, he was usurping the position of the high priest, you see. And, um, and so this rebellion, of course, um, came to, to God and to Moses and to Aaron. And in verse 19, it says, And Korah assembled all the congregation against them, Moses, meaning Moses and Aaron. All of the congregation followed this rebellion? Well, hasn't happened with the church, basically? Yeah, you know what Jesus said? All that came before me were thieves and robbers. You know, all of the congregation had gone astray following these um, reprobate leadership of Israel. Now, now watch. All the congregation against them unto the door of the tent of the meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Wow, the Lord was going to wipe out the whole congregation. The whole congregation. But Moses interceded. You know, Moses, um, in Hebrews chapter 3, uh, it speaks of Moses being the head over his house as Jesus was the head over his house. Moses represented something. And uh, actually... In much of the in much of the scriptures, Moses, when he was alongside of Aaron, represented the Lord. Why is that? Because the Lord said unto Moses that Aaron would be his mouthpiece, but he would be to him as God. Exodus chapter four tells us that he tell, shall be to you as God. What is that a type of? It's a type of the Lord and his man child. And so if you notice, it was Aaron doing the works, taking the, the staff, uh, doing the, the works. It was Moses speaking to him what to do. And Aaron did this. That's a type of the Lord returning with his man child in our day, you see. So anyway, watch. First of all, God says, OK, uh, step aside, boys. I'm going to wipe out the congregation. And um, that I may consume them in a moment, he says, in verse 22. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin? And wilt thou be wroth with all of the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Well, OK. <laughs> Speak unto the congregation and say to them, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Kor, Dathan, and Abiram. This is step two. I mean, God, uh, Moses had interceded, and uh, God said, Okay, the congregation is to get away from these men. I'm going to wipe them out, okay? <laughs> and and uh, Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and to the elders of Israel uh, followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed with all of their sins. And as you know, the Lord uh, caused the earth to open up, and it swallowed them alive. And they went down, verse 33, alive into Sheol. That was a judgment. But that's not the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing to me is verse 41. Look what it says. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses 
and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. This has always astounded me that the whole congregation could make such a foolish mistake. It's like, do you think that Moses and Aaron had the authority or the power to crack open the earth and swallow these guys alive? I thought, that's astounding. But you know, the same thing has happened to me. I've actually had a false prophet accuse me of, um, of bringing a curse upon him. Uh, um, and actually, I did speak some things, just like Moses spoke some things, and they came to pass. And uh, two or three things happened to this guy. So he accused me in front of his congregation that um, I had brought a curse upon him. And I just basically answered and I said, no, uh, Proverbs 26 and 2 says, the curse that is causeless alighteth not. You must have done something or this would not have happened. And of course he had. He was um, being a reprobate and uh, doing evil and uh, leading people astray. And also uh, Lamentations 3 and 37 uh, basically says the same thing. It says, uh, who says a thing and it comes to pass except I the Lord have commanded it. See, Moses commanded this, but it wasn't Moses, it was the Lord or it wouldn't have come to pass and they deserved a curse or it wouldn't have alighted. You know, Proverbs 26. So, so basically, um, the thought to me is amazing that all of the congregation could blame Moses and Aaron for killing the people of God like they weren't guilty and didn't deserve it and God didn't do it. You know, uh, that's amazing to me. But then verse 42 goes on to say, And it came to pass when the congregation was assembled against Moses and against Aaron like they didn't learn their lesson the first time, God was about to wipe them out. Moses interceded. God said, Step aside, I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses interceded. And God apparently, and I think apparently is a good word, changed his mind. And, uh, or appeared to change his mind. And so he says, okay, then tell the children of Israel to get away from the tents of these men. And so he wiped those, the, um, the rebels out, you know. And the men who took up their censers and burned incense before God, he killed all of them with fire from heaven. And, and so... Um, so now they're making the same mistake and in, in speaking against Moses and Aaron. And in verse 12, it says, They looked towards the tent of the meeting. Behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Same, same as last time. Okay. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of the meeting. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And uh, he's talking about the whole congregation again. God is so merciful and he's so patient. And all he's waiting for, obviously, is for somebody to intercede and say, Lord, please don't do that because of this or that or whatever, you know. We've seen several reasons so far because of a cry for mercy, because um, we've been we've done your will, Lord. Uh, we've been righteous. We've walked with you. Um, many different reasons, okay? that I may consume them in a moment. And once again, God is speaking a word out of his mouth that he's going to do that intercession has stopped. Now, it doesn't matter whether God's speaking it in a dream or in a vision or whether he's done it through circumstances. We still have this authority of intercession just like Moses did, just like Jesus did, right? We have this authority of intercession before God. And he's asking, he, he's wanting us to pray for something because he has determined to use our prayers to bring things to pass and to apparently, from our point of view, change things. He has determined to do that. Okay. Um, and they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take thy censer and put fire therein from off of the altar, and lay incense thereon, and carry it quickly unto the congregation, and make atonement for them, for there is wrath gone out from before the Lord. The plague 
is begun. So, very interesting. What do you think uh, the censer with incense represented? Well, I think it represents intercessory prayer. And uh, notice God spoke it, and it was instantly in motion. The judgment was in motion this time. And the plague was begun, only there needed to be an atonement to stop it in the midst of the judgment. And so um, I'm sure that God put it in the heart of Moses, and Moses, of course, told this to Aaron to take up his censer and go with it because the plague was going forth. To do what? To wipe out the congregation of Israel. Uh, verse 47, And Aaron took as Moses spake and ran into the midst of the assembly, and behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Wow. They that died of the plague were 14,700 besides them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the front of the tent of the meeting, and the plague was stayed. Can you imagine? Uh, the plague, the judgment was in motion that God spoke into existence with his very words. Again, it could have been many other ways that he could have spoken it. Uh, this is just prophecy can be a way or dreams or visions or whatever, or even circumstances. But he spoke it and it was in the midst of happening and intercession was made and there was a line drawn between the dead and the living. Now, some people say, mostly the prosperity gospel folks, <clears throat> say that God doesn't uh, send sickness. You know, uh, but God himself admits that he sends sickness. And in Deuteronomy 28, he mentioned so many, many sicknesses that he said he would send upon his people if they rebelled against his word. And in this case, of course, God sent a plague. You know, if we believe in the sovereignty of God, many times we will have the reaction that God wants us to have in a situation like this. Sometimes people don't have the reaction. They continue on in their rebellion and in their sins because they don't believe in the sovereignty of God. They believe the devil did this. Well, there's no reason to repent if the devil did this because obviously a bad devil is doing this to a good people, right? No, if you understand that God is doing this, the first thing you realize is that we are wrong. We got to repent. And... Uh, so a major error is to not understand the sovereignty of God. God works all things after the counsel of his own will, even if he uses vessels of dishonor to do it, like the devil. Because God does use the devil. In fact, the devil is the one who carries out the curse because he likes to. But the devil is not sovereign. God is sovereign. And in this case, the death angel was passing over, and they didn't have a Passover lamb because they weren't exercising faith in the sacrifice, and they weren't walking in repentance. So basically, the plague was taking them out, and intercession by Moses, just like intercession by us, can do this for family, friends, you know, children, whatever, you know, uh, uh, Job you know, interceded in prayer and, and sacrificed for his children, you know, because he was afraid that they had renounced God in their hearts, you know. And of course, we too, you know, uh, need to uh, walk in the steps of our Lord Jesus in interceding for people around us. Sometimes the Lord will do like he did uh, with uh, Amos. And, you know, the third time he told Amos, this is not a time for you to pray because this time I'm not going to pass by Israel any longer. This time I'm going to judge them like a plumb bob. And he stood beside a wall and there was this plumb bob, which is, of course, a way of saying I'm judging them according to the law. You know, it's going to be are they straight or are they not? You know, are they upright or are they not? You know, and so basically 
God judged him because he said he wasn't going to pass by him anymore. The Lord does this that way too. He says sometimes he just tells you, do not pray for this people. He says it many times to Jeremiah, to Ezekiel, Ezekiel in the scriptures. When he had enough, he said, don't pray for him because I'm going to judge him. I mean, he can actually step out ahead of you and say, okay, do not intercede this time. And he does that sometimes. And matter of fact, he's already had those two delays on America. As a matter of fact, I know that because God revealed it to me back in 1996. And I didn't really understand it until 1998. But he told me there were going to be two delays on America. Just like, in fact, he used Amos to point that one way is he used Amos to point that out to me. That the third time he wasn't going to delay. These judgments were going to proceed in their sequence. And uh, I believe we've passed the two times. Uh, leading up to 2000 was the first time, and 2006 was the second time. And even the Bible Code says it, that there was a delay in those two, two times of judgment upon America, of a nuclear war, matter of fact, of Russia and China and America. And so, and this is something the Lord revealed to me before I actually saw that, but one way he showed it to me was through Amos. And basically he's saying, uh, no, you're not going to be able to stop it this time. It's coming. Uh, that sequence of events that we call the tribulation period is now coming upon us. And it's not going to be delayed. So, um, but Moses interceded. Um, Jesus interceded. You know, I'll just point out something to you here in Luke uh, chapter 13. In verse 6. As they say, prayer changes things, right? And repentance, you know, intercession changes things. Not from God's perspective, because he's still working all things after the counsel of his own will, and history continues to repeat. The cycle continues, but from our perspective. In um, Luke 13 and verse 6. And he spake this parable. A certain man had a fig tree. What's the fig tree? Well, it's God's people, right? The fig tree. Wow. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And I think it's Isaiah chapter 5. It says that the vineyard is um, belongs to the Lord of hosts. It's his people, right? planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit thereon and found none. I believe that this has a couple of fulfillments, probably one for his Old Testament church that we call natural Israel and one for his New Testament church that we call spiritual Israel. Right? Um, so many of the pro uh, parables that Jesus spoke, they had two fulfillments, once for that day and once for our day. Because in that day, um, they were leading up to the end of the Old Covenant. And in this day, we're leading up to the end of the New Covenant. Okay, And so, uh, we're in a very similar time to what we see in the Scriptures. As a matter of fact, it's parallel to what we're seeing in the Scriptures. Okay, So, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit thereon and found none. Is he going to do that in this day? Yes. Same thing. And he said unto the vine dresser, I believe the vine dresser here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And uh, the Father is the one seeking the fruit. And he said unto the vine dresser, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why doth it cumber the ground? Well, that sounds very much like what we just read. You know, let's cut that. Let's cut them down. We'll cut the congregation down, right? And uh, I'll take this first fruits here. Moses, you're it. Well, I'll make of you another nation. That's what he told him. He says, but I'm going to cut them off. Did God know he was going to do that? He, he knew he was not going to do that from the foundation of the world but he had to get the desired result, and he did. The desired result was Moses, because of his uh, pity and his mercy, uh, interceded, and uh, 
the same thing as the Son of God is doing right here. Do you know something that about the, the Father and the Son is different? You know, the Bible says in Hebrews, let me read that to you. You know, the Father has never known sin nor known temptation. But the Son has. I want to read this to you. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. It says, Wherefore it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren. This is talking about Jesus. He, you mean he's made in all things like unto us? That's right. He is son of man and son of God. And we are son of man and son of God. Right? We are just less manifested as sons of God. He was the only born son of God. He was a manifest son of God. We are coming into our manifestation as we grow in him and become sanctified. So he had to be made in all things like unto his brethren so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation or covering for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to succor or come to the help of them that are tempted. So, so Jesus is very full of mercy and pity for us because he's been there. He knows what we wrestle with. He knows what we fight with. He was tempted with this. The Father's never been tempted. But Jesus has been tempted. So he's able to help us. He's able to be an intercessor for us, a mediator for us, because he knows where we've been. He knows what it is to feel this bondage of sin. Okay? He has been tempted. And so he knows what it feels like. And, and so the Father ordained Jesus to be this mediator because the Father has never been tempted, doesn't know what it's like, and is more um, uh, judges more according to the law. Okay? And Jesus comes along uh, to beseech the Lord for grace on our behalf because he knows where we're at. Okay, so Jesus, as this the mediator, says, verse 8, Luke 13 and 8, And he answered and saith unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit thenceforth, well, if not, thou shalt cut it down. Well, okay. He interceded. And the Father, of course, gave in to his intercession. And uh, the Father had spoken the word, cut it down. It hadn't borne fruit, cut it down. Well, I suspect we're in about the same position right now. The church has not borne fruit. And the Father has said, cut it down. And the Son has said, Lord, let me dig about it and dung it. <laughs> Basically, digging about it is breaking up the fallow ground through repentance, right? That's what the Bible calls it, breaking up your fallow ground um, till I come and rain righteousness upon you. So we have to break up our old hard ground, our old hard heart, you know, and uh, so that the Lord can, can get his word in there, right? And dung it. I think that could be persecution. Uh, <laughs> there's lots of things you could see there. But all of it uh, enables the plant to grow, Right, Everything that we go through here that the Lord sends us through as far as bringing us to repentance and persecution and all these things uh, bring us to the place where we can bear fruit. Now, we're about to enter that season where the church is going to bear the fruit. And the Son has interceded to the Father, just like he did with Israel. Uh, at that time, he brought a remnant out of old hard-hearted, stubborn, self-willed Israel. In our time, same thing's about to happen for the church. But the Father had pronounced the judgment to the Son of God. And the Son didn't just say, okay, let's do it that way. No, he interceded, he mediated, he, um, and the Father said, okay, 
we'll do it your way. And uh, praise God, I've done the same thing uh, with relatives. Uh, did the same thing with my mom years ago. She was in a hospital uh, in intensive care uh, on a, a heart monitor, a oxygen monitor, and she had been in a coma for some time, and she hadn't been getting the oxygen to her brain, and the doctors told me, says, David, she, she's just not going to live. And I had three doctors. One of them, my sister, told me, told me that. She's not going to live, and if she did, if she came out of it, she would be a vegetable because her brain hasn't been getting oxygen all this time. This oxygen monitor is beeping, beeping. I said, what's that beeping? Well, that means her brain's not getting oxygen it needs, you know. So, oh, okay. So I uh, was going to the hospital uh, to meet with them and uh, prayed that prayer. I interceded. I said, Lord, I know you have every right to take mom out. <laughs> I said, but um, I'm asking you to bring her through this thing so she can see her children one more time and draw closer to you and then take her out. <laughs> I did that. And, you know, uh, when I went to the conference meeting there with the doctors and they told me, says, she's just not going to come out of it. I says, oh, yes, she's going to come out of it. She's going to be fine. And they're looking at me like, oh, no, it's not possible. You know, it's just not possible. You know, I says, yeah, she's going to come out of it. She'll be fine. You know, she came out of it. She walked out of that place without any drugs. She went in there with a shoebox full of drugs. And she came out with no drugs. And the people that saw her, her friends said, what happened to her? You know, it's like a miracle, you know, amazing miracle. Because God answered our prayer. We interceded. Uh, yeah, she deserved to die. I'm going to tell you that the truth right now. She deserved to die and go just the way she was. But but we interceded and God answered and and she was a different person. Even people that were in her ACLF looked at her and said, wow, what happened to her? You know, because she's walking intelligibly now and she's not on drugs. And anyway, you can intercede too. God bless you. And I hope you've learned a little bit today and keep it with you. And, and we'll do this again sometime. God bless you. Good night. For more information and materials, go to www.unleavenedbreadministries.org I can cleanse my guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you my thirsting soul purest water made me whole let your streams of mercy flow oh jesus i trust in you